Dr. Christine Crever is a member of the International Association for Physicians in Aesthetic Medicine, the Botox Cosmetic Physicians Network, and a diplomate of the American Board of Family Medicine. Dr. Crever has spent years advancing her skills in aesthetic medicine and is a leader in the field of non-surgical aesthetic treatment. Her background includes extensive training in basic and advanced injection techniques with Botox and cosmetic dermal fillers, as well as physician strength chemical peels and non-invasive laser and light-based therapies. Dr. Crever is a diplomate of the American Academy of Facial Aesthetics. Dr. Louis Maltzmacher maintains a cosmetic and general dental practice in Bay Village, Ohio. He is an internationally recognized lecturer and author, known for his entertaining and comprehensive teaching style. He has vast experience in total facial aesthetics and has taught tens of thousands of healthcare professionals in the areas of smile design aesthetics and facial injectable therapy. He has also lectured at many major medical and dental meetings throughout the United States, Canada, Europe, and the Middle East. Dr. Maltzmacher is a Master of the Academy of General Dentistry, a Fellow of the International Association of Dental Facial Aesthetics, a fellow of the World Clinical Laser Institute and a visiting lecturer at a number of universities. Dr. Maltzmacher is president of the American Academy of Facial Aesthetics. You can contact the American Academy of Facial Aesthetics at 800-952-0521. Please visit www.facialaesthetics.org where you can find information on live patient hands-on Botox and dermal filler training for all healthcare professionals, given all across North America and other training DVDs on total facial aesthetics. What we're gonna do now is we are going to move to the clinical treatment room. And what you are going to find is that this works marvelously in a dental office, and for a few reasons. First of all, it's a matter of learning how to give some extra oral injections which, by the way, Dennis, that is so easy for you to do. You know, we end up working in this little, little cave that's called the mouth, and it's dark in there, and it's hard to get in there. Now you've got the entire face to work on, and it's really a pleasure, once you learn how to do these procedures, to work extra orally, and it's the same injections in a lot of the areas that you give anyway. Now, the other advantages of these procedures, as you're going to see, is, the, is that these are easily integrated into a dental office. Our first patient, Laura, you're going to see is going to only use Botox on the upper half of her face. And these procedures can be done very quickly. It's a matter of four to five minutes actual treatment time. At any point, you can go ahead and take a patient from hygiene and move them over. You know, Botox only lasts anywhere from three to four months. It happens to work very well in a recall schedule in a lot of dental offices, and it's such a quick treatment time. One of the big advantages here, it's a quick treatment time where you just literally take the patient over. If they're interested in Botox today, I take them over from the hygiene room, go straight to, the, to my, one of my treatment rooms because I don't really have to schedule for a four or five minute procedure. We're really usually geared up and we're really, really ready to go. We're usually really geared up and ready to go because it's a quick, quick treatment time. Obviously, there are financial benefits to providing this treatment for your patients also. First of all, why your patients in your practice? You've got a steady source of patients coming every single day to your office. A lot of the aesthetic physicians don't have that. They've got to draw new patients to their office. I've got patients coming in all the time. Not only that, these are patients that trust me and have been patients of mine for a long time. Now I've got a new service to offer them and it's very well accepted by my patients. No one's really ever said to me, oh, you're a dentist, why are you doing Botox? That's not the issue at all. They know me. I do a lot more invasive procedures as you will see, a lot more invasive procedures as you will see in the, on these patients. You know, I'll put five implants into a patient. I'll do a, a sinus lift. I'll do 10 crowns on the patients or veneers. These are much more invasive procedures most of the time than what you're going to see for this Botox treatment. The financial rewards obviously are there as well. 
you're talking about what you're going to see on this patient, you are talking about anywhere from six to $800 for a four minute treatment time. There's a cost to the Botox there too. These are highly productive procedures that can easily be a part of any dental office. We've got an interesting patient for you here too. Uh, what we're really going to do on her is, you know, let's take a look and evaluate her and you'll get a really good idea. She's got some deep nasolabial folds up and down on both sides, but give me a really big smile. And look, she's had some dental work. Just hold that smile if you can for us. She has some crowns that have been in there for quite a long time. She's actually pretty happy with the crowns. She doesn't want them redone. We talked about getting redone. She said, uh-uh, I'm happy with these crowns. And the crowns are clinically acceptable all the way around in terms of carries and no carries and margins and those kinds of things. So she doesn't want to change these crowns at all. We did talk about the gingival contours. She knows that they're not perfect. But when she goes to smile real big for me, she does not, she by herself does not go into this really big smile because she shows a lot of gum. So we're going to talk a little bit about gummy smile and kind of use a combination of a little bit of Botox and some dermal fillers to try to hide this gummy smile. The dermal fillers will be in these nasolabial folds and then you'll see what we're going to do with the Botox later on. But that's her, that's the setup of her case for right now. And it's going to be pretty straightforward, but let's show you how to do some really successful nasolabial folds. And then we'll talk about what to do with this gummy smile. So Joanne has some deeper nasolabial folds that have actually kind of developed in some creasing. Since we've given her her numbing, her infraorbital blocks, they're actually a little softer than they were uh, before we put the anesthetic in. Now that we've anesthetized uh, the area, the folds are actually a little softer looking than they were beforehand. If you feel like you're starting to lose track of where they are, you can ask the patient to smile broadly, and then we can press in laterally on the cheeks, and this will kind of help those creases sink in a bit more. And so when we let go, they become very clearly obvious. So we're gonna use uh, Juvederm Ultra Plus, and I'm gonna be using the uh, shorter needle. I'm going with a 30 gauge rather than the 27 that was packaged with it because I want a little bit more control and I want to work rather superficially because these creases are so well defined. So I'm going to have um, Joanne kind of tilt back and roll away from me. And I'm just inserting the needle into the mid to deep dermis and advancing it forward. We're trying to stay medial to the crease. We don't want this material building up laterally to the fold. And then I'm just going to apply a retrograde injection as I am pulling back. And you can really just see this material filling in. It does tend to want to go in initially a little bit lumpy, so we'll have to be doing some molding just to make sure it's smooth. And it's a series of injections when we're using the shorter needle. But I believe there's a bit more control using the shorter one than uh, the longer needle. It's really up to injector preference. Here I'm using a fanning technique where I'm not withdrawing the needle completely, but redirecting to fill in that area of volume loss just on the sides of the nostrils. And we can do some molding extraorally and intraorally. Open up for me, Joanne. And if we look, we can start to see an improvement on the right. I think she's going to need a bit more volume, so I'm going to go back and just give her some more injections on that side. So go ahead and tilt back again for me. Now, the more injections you do, the greater likelihood of bruising. That's why there is uh, some benefit to using a longer needle. But if a nasolabial fold is not exactly a straight shot, if it has a bit of a curve to it or an S-shaped configuration, it may be um, a better choice to use a shorter needle. And again, I'll have you open. And we'll just kind of gently massage this material just to make it smooth. I often tell patients after these injections, they will be able to feel this material here. The skin will just seem a little bit denser and more firm. These really aren't lumps or bumps. In fact, um, if a patient is sensing a lump or a bump, um, typically what they are sensing is just more the, the, the extra firmness from the material. 
if the injections are done properly and molding is done during the period where the material um, is still malleable, lumps and bumps really shouldn't be a problem. Now let's see upright again, Joanne. Very nice. I'm using the same technique as the other side. And as you can notice, her nasolabial fold isn't exactly a straight shot. It has a slight S configuration, so the shorter needle um, is going to give me a bit more control. The depth of placement is important. If the material is placed too superficially, it can sometimes be seen through the skin in something that's known as the Tyndall effect, where you'll have a blue-gray appearance um, where the light is being diffused through the skin and the clear material underneath. If that does happen, it's easy enough to express that um, too superficially placed material by nicking the skin with a slightly larger gauge needle and then just pressing. If Alternately, if the material is placed too deep, um, you're probably not going to get the result you're looking for. Um, and if you do get the result, it's definitely not going to last um, as long as you might otherwise like, as the vascularity um, improves as the deeper we go into the skin. Okay, and let's see you upright again, Joanne and just turn towards me. Excellent. She still has some creasing in here. I'm going to switch my technique up a little bit and do some cross hatching techniques where I am um, going to be placing almost strut like uh, linear threads uh, perpendicular to her crease and I think that's going to give us a bit more support. So turn towards me this way. And you'll notice rather than going parallel to the line I'm going to come across it this way. I'm overshooting the crease a bit and just placing little dollops of material that will support this line across its weak point. There are, I'm doing a fair number of injections here. Um, Luckily, our patient's very comfortable because we've put in an adequate block. And you can see the result from that, um, the use of the cross technique there. And again, we're just coming across and leaving a small amount of material in a perpendicular fashion across this nasolabial fold. We know that layering the material does help with duration and overall effect. That's true within a, any given procedure, but also as we repeat this procedure over time, in another six or nine months, we're going to get better results and greater duration with each additional application. and we'll have you come up right again. And that's a really lovely result. Joanne has a few needle marks and maybe some potentially early bruising. Um, but her folds were a little bit deeper and required a few more injection points and a bit of molding. That should clear it for her in, a, in less than a week. And prior to that is coverable with makeup. What we're going to do now is inject her for this gummy smile. And because she's numb, you can't appreciate it, but remembering what she had before, she showed a lot of gum. We can't correct the gingival contours. That's going to be corrected. That's going to be corrected with a dental procedure. But now, with this combination of dermal fillers and a little bit of an injection right here, and these are the levator muscles for this upper lip, we're not going to knock them out completely because I don't want her to have a flat lip and never be able to go ahead and raise that upper lip because then she won't be able to show any of these teeth and she won't be happy with that either. We just want to give her enough and this of course takes some training and it shouldn't be your first patients and you need to, to get a feel for how Botox works. But we want to give her enough so that she can lift her lip up 
somewhat, but not lift it up totally. Now this dermal filler also will prevent her from lifting it up all the way as she had done before. But the combination of Botox and dermal filler together will be a really nice combination for her. And these are just quick injections. There isn't even really much to see. But imagine that this levator muscle is going from here down to the upper lip from here down to the upper lip. Nothing to do with nasolabial fold. That's just you know a fold caused by the loss of volume. But it's gonna pick up this whole area of lip and this whole area of lip here. If we can just have it so instead of picking it up like this, which she does now, just pick it up a little bit more, then her smile will look a lot nicer because you won't be showing all that gum. So these are very quick injections. I would start off on her. And on, on, on a patient with a little bit of a gummy smile, I might start off only with one unit. On her, I'd start off with two units on each side. And here is where you gotta play with this a little bit. Two weeks later, they come in for an evaluation. So these are gonna be just really, really quick injections. And that's the two units on that side. Turn towards me there just a little bit. And you can see what a beautiful job that, that uh, Dr. Kerber did with these fillers here, there too. And here's another injection right there, almost at the base of the nose. And that little bit of Botox is really going to go far in helping her with that gummy smile. But we'll see you again in a couple of weeks, and then we'll see how that looks and evaluate you from there. But that should really help you. You may still show a little gum, but not nearly as much gum as you showed before. Laura. Uh, Laura's 34 years old and she presents today with some common problems um, that a lot of women her age um, are concerned about. Um, most of them are in the upper face um, and lines, mostly lines that are associated with expression. If we start at the top, we can see that she has um, some lines kind of running horizontally across the forehead and over the brows. When we see these lines um, in repose, we classify them as static lines. And so, um, she, again, she's got these horizontal forehead lines statically running across the forehead. We can intensify these lines by having her raise her uh, brows and activate the movement of the muscle um, called the frontalis. And so I'm going to ask Laura to go ahead and raise her brows right now to look surprised. And you'll see there is a, um, a, a marked intensification or deepening of these lines during the contraction of this muscle. So. In order to treat these lines, um, we'll be targeting that muscle with a little bit of Botox to take some of the intensity out of that contraction and allow the skin to um, stay in a more relaxed state. If we look between her brows in the glabellar area, um, she has some early uh, lines, not quite the 11 that um, we often hear about, but it's the beginnings of some lines here just at the top of the nose. And if we have her uh, frown or make a mean face, I'm going to have you do that, Laura. We can see the activation of a uh, complex of three muscles, which work um, in conjunction to bring the brows together and down. The center muscle is uh, called the procerus, and it works with two muscles on the side called the corrugators. And again, these muscles, which are very um, evident on Laura, you can see kind of pull the brow inwards, and then procerus pulls it down, which leads to some horizontal lines at the top of the nose. So we'll be targeting that muscle group as well. If we have Laura smile um, really big, we can see um, on the sides of her eyes, what commonly referred to as the crow's feet area, um, some dynamic lines. At rest, they're still there, uh, they're present to a lesser degree. And so by treating this area, um, we'll be able to achieve a number of things. One is we'll allow the eye to open more fully. We'll also be able to treat um, the lines that are both dynamic and static. Although many of Laura's concerns are in the upper face, we would like to take a look at the lower face as well, as our goal is to give her a total facial aesthetic. Um, if we look um, on, at the nasal labial fold areas of her mouth, we'll notice she's had a, just a small amount of volume loss here, which is resulting in a small amount of shadowing. It's also occurring in the oral commissures, which is lending to an um, early marionette line. Um, and so we can come into these areas and augment them with dermal fillers, um, which will kind of restore some of the volume and hopefully um, return her oral commissures to a more uh, neutral position. 
We've established that Laura's main concerns are in the upper face and are the results of uh, muscles of expression that are causing lines um, in the forehead, uh, between the brows, and around the eyes. We've determined that we're going to use Botox to target the overactivity in these muscles and help the skin relax. We'll start by treating the area between the brows. And as I've mentioned before, there's a complex of three muscles that causes the brows to move inwards and down. Many patients, even when they're not actively using these muscles, carry a bit of resting tone. And that results in um, kind of a, a, a droopier, tired, or angry face that may be unintentional. I'm going to ask Laura to accentuate these lines by uh, giving me a frown or a mean face. And again, we can see when that happens, the brows are drawn inwards and downwards. We're going to use a pattern of five injections, starting directly in the center of the procerus. And then we're also going to place two injections in the corrugators on either side. By placing these injections in this position, we'll target all three together and reduce the intensity of uh, this frowning action that she has, uh, that she's using right now. We also want to target the horizontal lines um, in her forehead. We know those lines are the result of the muscle called the frontalis. It's a muscle that runs from the temporal fusion line on either side um, and from the brows to the forehead. The muscle fibers are oriented in a pattern that raises the brows. And so when we ask her to raise her brows or give us a surprise look, you can really see the true action of that muscle. Many times this is um, a muscle that has two distinct bellies, and we can kind of see this in Laura here. There's a little absence of musculature in here, which results in a small dip in the lines. So when we're putting Botox in this muscle, we really want to cover the muscle. We, wanna, we know that there is going to be a decent amount of diffusion between the points we, we apply, but we want to spread our injection points out in a way that will, um, that will adequately treat the muscle um, without over-treating. And so I usually use a pattern um, that just gently spaces out our medication in a way that covers the entire frontalis and will relax it so that when Laura uses this muscle, she'll have a little bit of movement. She'll maintain a natural expression. She won't be really able to abuse the skin and pull it up into deep lines that then result in, in static lines, which stay there um, when her face is at rest. Now we'll move to the area around the eyes, commonly known as the crow's feet. The muscle responsible for these lines is the orbicularis oculi. It's activated when a patient smiles, and I'll have Laura smile, and you can see especially in the uh, lateral portion of this muscle, as the muscle shortens, the skin overlying becomes gathered, resulting in uh, lines that occur um, radially out from the eye. The other thing that's happening when this obicularis oculi muscle contracts is the superior lateral portion of it is actually pulling her upper lid down. And so you'll see when she smiles, her eyes actually close up a bit. Um, many patients want their eyes to be a bit more open. It looks more relaxed. It looks more awake. And so by treating this muscle, we'll be targeting the lines, but we'll also be allowing her eyes to really be open um, and bright. So I'll have her activate that muscle again and smile big for me. And we'll use a pattern of three injections to target that muscle. I'll have you turn towards me and we'll see the other side and smile again, Laura. And we'll use the same thing on the other side. I position my injection points in order to give myself some space between her orbital rim as well as the zygoma. We want to target the obicularis oculi and only the obicularis oculi. There are muscles of facial expression, um, including the zygomatous major and minor, which are required for smiling. Go ahead and smile for me. And they draw the lip upwards. If I'm placing my, if I'm placing my injections too close to the zygoma, we risk having some diffusion down to muscles which are not intended to be targeted. This is also true um, regarding muscles of extraocular movement. We want to make sure that our injection points are at least a centimeter or so away from the orbital rim to prevent unwanted diffusion into muscles we really don't want to be treating with Botox. Should our injection points be located too close to muscles um, which we intend to preserve, we could run into a few problems. 
if our zygomatous muscles are affected, we could end up with something called a liptosis or a dropped lip so that when Laura smiles, she won't have adequate, adequate lift on the affected side. It's not really the look we're going for, and so we really want to make sure that we're placing our injections in a way that target exclusively the muscle um, in question, which for Laura here on the side is going to be the orbicularis oculi. Botox is very safe and effective, but there are a few pitfalls that we need to be mindful for. Training is essential. Um, you can, it's possible to take a cookbook approach to Botox, but really every patient is different. With hands-on training, you'll be able to identify the muscles and the idiosyncrasies of those muscles in each individual patient and know where to place your injections to avoid potential problems. For injection, we're going to be using a 31-gauge insulin needle. I like these needles particularly for Botox for a couple of reasons. They're very comfortable for patients, they're well marked and easy to use, and they're zero waste, which is important when you're using an expensive product like Botox. I'm going to start by treating her glabella. And I've made my marks, um, which, have, which we've placed while she's been using the muscles. Here she's in a relaxed position and I don't require her to contract the muscles while I inject. I'm going to start with the central injection which overlies the procerus muscle. I like to stabilize the patient and actually pinch the skin when I'm doing my injections. The injection targets the belly of the muscle and we basically, I'm injecting five units into that muscle. As dentists, I'm sure you're familiar with needle phobic patients um, and many patients who've never had Botox before are a little anxious about these needles but they are extremely fine, very comfortable and this is usually a procedure that can be done in a matter of minutes. I'm going to move on to her corrugator muscles now and again, I like to, uh, I like to isolate the muscles between my fingers and then place the injection another five units into that spot. In the lateral corrugator, I'm placing in an additional five units. And then I'll move over to her other side. Isolate the muscle, and then near my injection point, go ahead and place another five units. And again, another five units. Next, we're gonna go ahead and inject her frontalis. I've made a series of marks which will allow adequate diffusion across this relatively broad muscle. With Laura, because she is female, and most females are in general going to be looking for um, somewhat of a lateral arch in the brow, I'm going to be placing the bulk of uh, the dose of this muscle into the center. And I, as I am moving laterally, I am decreasing um, the number of units in my injections. This will allow for some sparing of muscle activity just above the brows, which will help Laura achieve a nice curve to the lateral brow. Turn towards me this way. You may notice some small welts that are appearing after each of these injections. These are minor and will typically disappear within a few minutes after injection. Now I'm going to go ahead and inject the crow's feet area again over the lateral orbicularis oculi. This is one area where bruising can be common um, if the proper technique is not followed. Um, we need to observe the area carefully and look for veins. They're usually fairly evident, and we need to place our injections in a position that will not uh, nick or rupture these veins and lead to bleeding under the skin, which may result in a small bruise all the way up to a black eye. Again, training is essential, and having um, someone hands-on really kind of show you uh, the ropes uh, is really important to being able to avoid these adverse reactions. And so we'll place an injection there and another injection here and then another one here. I've moved to Laura's other side just to get a better angle um, on her left side when I do my injections. I place a little tension on the skin, insert the needle, and place my injection.
So I'm going to let Laura know that these Botox injections are not going to become effective for, on average, three to five days. It may take an additional week after that for the full effects to be realized. In terms of post-care, we're going to let Laura know that uh, she should avoid any kind of vigorous exercise. Certainly rubbing or manipulation of the area should be avoided. And in general, I just tell patients to kind of take it easy for, the, for a day or so. How was that, Laura? It wasn't bad. Felt um, the eyes was a little bit the worst, probably. But the other part just felt like plucking a hair or something. Nothing didn't hurt bad at all. Our next patient is Liz. And Liz is a 62-year-old woman. Doesn't look like it. You know, 62 is now the new 40 or 30 or whatever it is. Um, she's had some treatments before, but now some of those treatments have worn off and she has some needs that we're going to address right now. Now, we are dentists. There's no question that we are dentists. So the first thing that we always are going to assess are her teeth and her smile. So smile as big as you can for me, Liz. Turn towards me there just a little bit. Smile as big as you can. Give me the widest smile you can. Now take a look at her dentistry. Her dentistry actually is amazing because when I first met Liz, the first thing I asked her is if she's ever whitened her teeth. And she said, why would I whiten my teeth? I've got crowns. And she has some excellent crowns that are about 20 years old. You know, if we made them today, they would be obviously a lot whiter. But they look fairly white as it is, but they're just very natural. But what's interesting to note is as you take a look at her, and this is what happens as we get older, you know, some of the facial features start to drop. Give me the widest smile you can. Good. Say money. Money. Good. And, you know, that's the widest mouth she, ha she has. She only comes to about the midline, the middle of, she only comes to about the middle of her incisors as you see it. So, and she shows some lower teeth there as well. But, you know, we've, we want to be careful with this because we're going to do some work in this area. You know, she's expressed some concerns about her lips not having them defined enough. We want to make sure we add a little bit of volume, not too much volume, because we still want her to have some of this teeth show. But we also want to have her to have, her have a little bit more vermilion show as you see in her smile there as well. So when we talk about smile now for from the dental perspective, it's not just teeth. We've got to get away from, we, teeth are still important. We are still teeth centric, but now we've got to really get into the whole smile area, which is going to be all these areas right around here. What we're also going to address, just rest for a second. Turn this way just a little bit. That's a little too much turn that way a little bit. What we're also going to address are all these little lip lines and we're going to address that with a little bit of Botox that's going on here there as well. She also has some turning down of the corners of her mouth. Um, make a like a frowning kind of look for me. Take a look at this. This is the depressor anguli oris. We're going to go ahead and address this as well and a little bit of Botox here. Just relax for me. Just relax again. Good. A little bit of, of Botox right here in the depressor anguli oris, and this will actually turn up these corners of the lips without having to do much anything else. So we're going to use some Botox around the mouth, and let me just tell you a little bit about the depressor anguli oris here. It actually, it, it's a depressor, and it, anguli means angles, and oris is around the corners of the mouth. So as this pulls down on her, what happens is, over time, that's going to go ahead and turn down the corners of her mouth. She also has a little bit of volume loss, which you can see, and that will be addressed with some fillers there as well. So, you know, this is a combination of Botox and dermal fillers, especially for this area. This muscle starts at the corner of the mouth, and it comes down to the bottom of the mandible. But as it comes down, you know, most, most professionals, if they treat this, they make the mistake and try to isolate it around the corner of the mouth. If you do that, it's at a very tight pinpoint. It's hard to really address up here, and many times it's missed. And you get some other muscles, which doesn't really affect the patient, but it's very hard to miss. But what's interesting about this muscle is it starts here, but as it comes straight down, it really starts to angle and it winds into a big fan. So we always inject right down there. If you think corner of the mouth, corner of the mouth here and just go straight down and you hit right above the mandible, then you will go ahead and get that depressor anguli oris and this will eventually over the course of a week or two start to lift up the corners of the mouth. So it's a great way to really treat these things. Now, here's where we end up working together. Let me turn it over to Dr. Krever. She'll address the lip issue and some of the other soft tissue that we're going to address with dermal fillers. So with the dermal fillers on Liz, one of the main things we're going to be doing is restoring some uh, definition and a little bit of volume to her lips. 
With age, we start to see an effacement of the vermilion border, where we don't see a nice, crisp definition between the white and the red. This is fairly evident on Liz. She has a nice projection to her lip, and she has a wonderful shape, but she really doesn't have a well-defined border between the vermilion and the white of her skin. By going in with a little bit of dermal fillers, we can really restore that and give her a wonderful platform to apply her lipstick to. She'll be very pleased with the outcome. Again, I just want to make the point as we do this, what's really essential, we want to give her enough volume to satisfy her needs and give her a little bit more of a pout and more defined lips. But again, give me a big smile again there. We want, we want to make sure that we still give her some some teeth show when she smiles because it's the whole thing together. So, and again, this is where you, where you learn all these things in training. This is, this is a fine line. If we give her really big lips, she doesn't show any teeth, but she's got nice lips. If we don't give her enough lips, she's got nice teeth, but not enough lip show. So you know, those things work together very well. We'll also be using the dermal fillers in the corners of her mouth. In conjunction with the treatment of the depressor anguli oris, a little bit of filler right in the oral commissure will help restore that neutral position and take away that kind of sad frowny look um, that she may be starting to develop. The abicularis oris muscle, which becomes hyperactive as we age, is really contributing to these radial lip lines or quote unquote smoker's lines that patients refer to. And we'll go ahead and have Liz go ahead and pucker for us. And you'll see that when she does that, you notice a marked worsening of the lines. It's a real clue into the fact that the activity of that muscle is really responsible uh, for the, the development of these lines. A little well-placed Botox in this area will do a wonderful job to relaxing that muscle and really helping these lines start to fall out. And it's important to note, Liz starts with a wonderful shape to her lips. We don't want to alter that. We're really just here to enhance. Uh, many patients will come in with a ripped out picture from a magazine, and they'll ask for a set of lips that really is not fit for their face. So there's an important part to educating the patient and really coming to an understanding before you start your procedure so that the patient knows um, what they can expect. Botox by itself does not really require getting the patient numb because these are very quick injections and it's, it's not worth it. You would just double the work of injections with no real benefit. But when it comes to placing dermal fillers, especially in the nasolabial folds and around the lips, we want to get a patient numb. There are many healthcare professionals that don't want to get a patient numb or can't do it adequately, and they're afraid of giving intraoral injections. That's not us, and we do this all the time. So we can get them adequately numb. For Liz's case, what we would do to get her numb is we're going to give her, we're going to be working in this entire area here. So we're going to give her some infraorbital blocks to go ahead and get her numb and the mental foramen blocks. About a half a carpule each will just about do the job for her. We'll also get her numb a little bit in the corners of the mouth. If you remember anything about anatomy, you will remember, which we've all forgotten by the way, but you will remember that if you give an infraorbital, then you know this will address this area up here all the way up to the midline on both sides. Mental foramen will address these areas around around here, both of those injections will miss the corners of the mouth. So I always infiltrate a little bit into the corners of the mouth and then your patient will be completely numb. It's crucial that you assess the patient beforehand, just like we're doing here. It's crucial that you assess the patient beforehand before you get them numb, because after you get them numb, you'll lose a little bit. So it's really important that you get, you assess first, get them numb, and then you can go ahead and treat them. And kind of map out what you've done, something that Dr. Crever has taught me kind of over the years, is you map out what, you've, what you're going to do before you get them numb. This way you've got an action plan after you get them numb. Also, you always want to treat the patient sitting up. Because when you lay them back in our dental chairs, as we are prone to do every time we do dental treatment, some of these lines start to disappear, and then you really throw off some of your landmarks. So they're always in a sitting or semi-sitting position before we start treatment. Now let's get her numb, and we're going to go ahead and start treating Liz. We're going to go ahead and start uh, by doing some dermal fillers in Liz's lips and around her mouth. We're going to be using Juvederm Ultra. It's a hyaluronic acid-based uh, dermal filler. They come packaged uh, with a syringe and a special needle. So I'm going to remove the sterile cap and go ahead and place the needle on the syringe. Needle disengagement can be an issue with these thicker products when you're trying to extrude them through the very fine needles that they come with. So it's important to make sure that you really engage the needle onto the syringe securely. You may want to give it a little extra twist just to make sure it's on properly. 
Now we've already gone ahead and uh, numbed Liz, so she's very comfortable at this point. I'm going to start by just cleansing Liz's skin with a little alcohol wipe. And of course, you never want to inject any skin that's having problems at the time um, of the appointment. If she's got some kind of rash, certainly if she has any type of um, cold sore outbreak, this is a procedure you're going to want to postpone for another time. Okay, so as we've noticed before, uh, Liz has a little early downturn of her oral commissure, so we're going to just go ahead and pick that up uh, with a few injections of the dermal filler. What we're going to do here is that we are going to go ahead and give her dermal filler first and then Botox afterwards. And what's really important when you're doing a total facial aesthetic case, which involves teeth, dermal filler, and Botox, always want to do the teeth first. Get all your dentistry done, whether it's cosmetic dentistry, no matter what it is, because that's permanent. All these things are temporary fillers and temporary procedures, so we always want to work around what's permanent. So that's really key. Then in this kind of a combination case of Botox and dermal fillers, always do the fillers first. That's where you want to go. Then we'll add the Botox afterwards. That little volume of the Botox, especially around the lips, can throw off what you might think you're doing with the dermal fillers. And as you can see, we're already starting to see a result just by adding a little extra fill, a little extra support to that oral commissure. I'm going to go ahead and just do a bit more. I'm bringing my um, lines of injection, and this is a somewhat of a linear threading technique, but I'm doing it perpendicular to the weak spot um, in this oral commissure. It's providing almost a splinting action that's going to keep that oral commissure in a more neutral position. Sometimes we need to mold the filler a bit. I like to do that with fingertips, but when I'm in a tight area, a cotton-tipped applicator works great. I'm going to go ahead and just switch sides uh, and work on her other oral commissure. And from this angle, it's pretty obvious. You can see the difference between right and left with this injection. Here on her left, we notice that downturn is still evident. But on the right, it's significantly picked up after just a few injections. And I just want to reiterate again, part of what we're doing here is some of this is volume loss. And you can see she's replaced the volume. But again, the muscle action from this depressor angle iorus, that, we've got to take that out a little bit because it's that combination that's giving her these downturn lips. By treating the DAO, we'll also make the filler hold up, really last a bit longer because it won't have the added stress of constantly being pulled downward by the action of the muscle. So Liz, I'm going to have you turn a little bit towards me again and go ahead and tilt your head back. I'm going to go ahead and give you that. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm just placing this injection kind of perpendicular to the weak spot, just offering a little bit of support there and restoring the volume. It's possible to create a little lattice work um, of linear threading, which really kind of supports this area. And again, that's picked that corner up nicely. I'm just going to give her a bit more. And with the, each injection after Dr. Crever injects, she's going in first and on the way out she is laying down a thread of material there. And that's really, that really works out nicely. So you can really see where the material is going with each injection. All right. So now I'm going to move on to uh, basically defining the lower lip line. Again, we've said that Liz has a great shape, very nice projection, but really no defined border to her vermilion um, here on the bottom. Let me just go ahead and review a little bit of the lip anatomy for you there as well. You take a look at her lips. This is the vermilion area, and this is the cutaneous area. This we call the vermilion border. I think most people are very familiar with that. What we're going to do as we inject dermal fillers is we are always going to inject right inside the vermilion border, and that's really going to define Liz's lips there. Open your mouth for me just a little bit there, Liz. Now you take a look in here again, and you see the wet dry line. You've got where it's dry on the outside, wet from the inside of the mouth. You're never going to inject filler past that wet dry line. And that really is crucial because you're going to have an effect that's just going to go into the mouth that you're really not going to see. You've also always got to think as you define lips and add volume to the lips, the, the contralateral action that's happening. 
If I add some filler inside that vermilion border, it's going to push the lip out and give you more vermilion show. That's highly desirable by many women. If I go ahead and add some in the subcutaneous area and the cutaneous area, as Dr. Crever just did, that's going to go ahead and hide some of that vermilion show. So whenever you're doing corners of the mouth and lips together, you do it just in the order that Dr. Crever is doing. You do the corners of the mouth first, that's going to go ahead and push the corners of the mouth in and those hide the lips a little bit. Then you go ahead and do the lips and that will then push the vermilion show and get it back out again to where you want it. So I'm gonna go ahead and start here. I'm gonna have Liz go ahead and put your head back for me. A little this way. I'm gonna go ahead and start in the corner here on the right. And what I'm actually doing is I'm gonna nearly cannulate the vermilion border with my needle. There is a small potential space here that readily accepts the fill and is a perfect border for you to place um, your additional definition. So and you can really see the needle kind of slipping into that space. It's possible to then go ahead and palpate the needle just to check position. But then again, we're gonna do a retrograde injection. So I'm injecting as I am withdrawing the needle. And we've placed a little bit of filler there that can be kind of pinched and molded. Again, to just provide a little bit of definition right there on the border. I'm gonna pick up where that needle ended and just continue this way all the way around the lip. I can even palpate the needle during injection. You can actually feel that fill being accepted into that potential space. And you can see it as you move along. So I'm basically just working my way around the lip border, providing an outline. This is not a lot of material I'm injecting. Really just enough to place a bit of definition into this bottom lip. And you can already see what a wonderful difference that's made here for Liz. And that's a key point. What we're really doing here now is just adding definition there. Um, we'll add a little bit of volume, but we're going to do that more into the belly of the lip here. But right now, as we go along the vermilion border, what Dr. Carver is doing is just adding some definition. That is something that Liz was very concerned about, and now she'll get the results that she wants. Now she has a nice, crisp border to that bottom vermilion. And again, it provides just a great platform for her to be placing her lipstick. Tremendous. I'm going to go ahead and use the same process for the upper lip. And again, it's nice to just have a patient turn away. We're going to start in the corner. Again, just cannulating the border between the vermilion and the cutaneous area. And just working our way around. You can really see, you can really make the outline of the needle just on that border. And again, this is not about adding volume at this point. We are really just defining her lips. And Dr. Kriver did something very important there. She did not go past this Cupid's bow. You do not want to go past that Cupid's bow because you want, otherwise the patient gets a real duck lip and a flat lip that goes all the way around. So she stopped right around there and that's really crucial. The old duck lips that people used to get when they had dermal fillers, that's out. Nobody wants that anymore. So that, that was a perfect place to stop. Dr. Kerber did the one side. I'm going to show you a little bit on the other side here to kind of make things match. And then what we're going to do is add some volume to that lower lip right in the middle, right in the pouting area. And you really want to start right all the way at the corner. Open for me just a little bit there, Liz. You want to start right in the corner and get right underneath, right in that same space, right between the vermilion border and right inside the vermilion border but you can see it literally fill up as you go. And wherever you ended up, that's where you then start your next injection. And again, I'm going to go all the way right to the Cupid's bow, not go past. I can't tell you how important that is.
and she's getting a really nice fill and some really nice definition. And I'll even raise this up. You can see where the tip of my needle is right by the top of that Cupid's bow. Just going to give her just a little bit of a thread. You know, it's with dermal fillers, you just give what you need. A lot of dentists don't want to hear that. What they want to know is tell me exactly how much to put there. It's not exact like dentistry. You can't think like a dentist there. And now that little fill, and you can feel it with your fingers, just kind of rolled around as Dr. Trevor was doing. I mean, now she's got some nice evenness and a nice outline that she's got all the way around. Take a look at me a little bit, Liz. Just going to actually add a little bit more right at the top of that Cupid's bow. And Liz is very comfortable there, and this should raise that up quite nicely. And this material is moldable, especially, you know, initially after you put it in there. And now that looks pretty well defined here. We're just going to move that around. And yes, she is a living live patient, so she does bleed a little bit here and there, and that's all okay. Actually, she's done tremendously well. You know, lips are highly vascularized, so the fact that, you know, she's bled as little as possible is just kind of amazing. Now I'm going to really concentrate just turn that way just a little bit. I'm going to really concentrate in the middle third. The middle third is a pout. And, you know, as Dr. Trevor talked about, she's got this nice roll to her lip here. But now we're just going to have her a little bit more volume. And we're not going to go right at the vermilion border here. We're going to go a little bit more right into the belly here. Not going to open for me just a little bit, Liz. Not going to go past this wet dry line. We, the, there's no point in putting it in there because you won't see it anything. It'll be projecting inside. So we're just going to give her just a little bit you know, here's the, the middle third of her lip is pretty much from here to here. We're going to give her some here. We're going to give her some here. Again, it won't take much because she's got some fairly, fairly nice lips there already. We're just going to go a little bit deeper into the lip, right into the belly there. I'm just going to give that a little bit as we come out. Now we're going to do the other half of this lip. And again, we're going to go right about in the middle of this belly here. And we're just going to go right a little bit deeper. Just give her a little bit more as we pull out. At this point, what I like to do also is open for me just a little bit, especially for that lower lip, because we've added the outline of the borders here, and then we've added some right in the middle. So I like to take a gauze and just kind of roll it all in my fingers just to kind of even it out. And it's malleable material, so you're really able to move this around if you need to. And it's important for the patients to know that, too. For the first few hours, they should not be touching this at all. They should not do any heavy puckering or anything like that, because you can literally move these materials around, especially in the first few hours. But those lips really look great now. What we're going to do now is we're going to go up to these filtrums and actually give her a little bit more definition. She's a little flat right in here, and that she was that before we got her numb, but certainly with that, now let's give her a little bit of definition uh, right there. And Dr. Trevor will do this side, and I'll do that side, and we'll show you how we do a little bit of a filtrum injection just to kind of build this out and give this whole area a little bit more definition. And again, I can't stress enough, it's all, again, you've got to mold this all with her teeth and her, uh, her teeth show, lip show, vermilion show, it's all one thing together and giving her a really great look all around and really giving her a really great smile. That's what it's really all about. So again, we're going to go ahead and really define her filtral columns. This will help a lot also uh, in defining the cupid's bow. She's a little bit more effaced just because she's under uh, a local anesthetic, um, but certainly effacement of the filter columns is something that does happen with age. So Liz, please come turn to me like this. And again, I like to kind of identify where the filter column is. So I'm just going to start at the very peak of the cupid's bow. And I'm going to go ahead and just cannulate this filter column. This is typically an extremely sensitive area for patients, so it's critical that they have a, a nice dental block in place. I don't want to put too much material in here. The injection is relatively superficial. You can really take a look at Liz now. This filtrum is done, this filtrum isn't. You can see how much flatter that is. I'm now going to do this side to kind of go ahead and match this. I'm going to do it just the way that Dr. Krevit did. We're going to start right at the top of the Cupid's bow and just go up. And she, words, she uses fancy words like cannulate. And I just say go up right underneath the skin there and give some definition 
to this. Just a little bit is all you need. We don't need a lot. We don't want these things popping out of her face. Just a little bit of definition as you come all the way out. And now you can see she's got a little bit more of a filter in there. You can even feel this with your fingers. So you want to go ahead and make sure that you smooth that out and make sure you smooth out anything. What I like to do at this point too is go ahead and take either a pen or a pencil and kind of put it right between the filtrums and just kind of roll this around. And again, I don't want to do this too vigorously because of all the filler in her lip, but just kind of roll this around and now you can really see some definition in this filtrum area. And this is, again, highly desirable by many, many patients is to be able to have fuller lips and this filtrum area with a little bit more filtrum show. So there's a lot of definition in here. Nobody really likes this flat look um, on top of this. And again, part of that duck lip appearance is when this whole area is just flat and the filler goes completely across. We wanna make sure that we totally, totally get away from that and give them nice, adequate lips that are not deficient and are a little bit more full. Now let me go to the Botox treatment. Now that we've done all of this filler material, now we can actually go to the Botox treatment here. And what we're going to do is take care of these little lip lines. Now again, you know, something that's important to understand is that filler material will last about six months, Botox will last about three months. And what's really, really crucial is you've got to kind of manage that in terms of the length of these things. All these are very temporary materials. They will be gone completely when they are gone. Then the patient has got to come back for more uh, when the treatment actually wears off. But she had all these little lip lines. See, now you don't even see them all that much because of the numbness and everything else. But if you can, even know what your lips feel like, pucker for me a little bit. Yeah, and it's funny. They give you these funny faces. But what you're going to do here is Think about the obicularis oris, and that's the surround muscle around the mouth. That's a muscle we deal with all the time. What I want to do, I don't want to take that muscle out. If I take that muscle out, what will happen? I mean, her lips will be dropping off her face. We don't want that to happen. Um, but what we do want is to lessen the intensity of that obicularis oris. Once I do that, then the less puckering that she can do, she can still pucker, she can still smile, she can still do all of that but the less intensity she has, those little lip lines will start to smooth away. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give her some Botox in this lip, and I'm, I don't care exactly where the lip lines are, and I think that's crucial. That throws off a lot of practitioners. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to just give it equidistance and symmetrical all the way around because I want to affect this entire obicularis oris and what I want to do is just you know symmetrically make sure that it has less intensity. Less intensity will then cause less of these lip lines over time. And again the dermal filler effect you see right away. The effect from the Botox you don't see for three to five days. So in a couple of weeks we'll see all of this kick in. After that, I'm going to go to the depressor anguli oris, give her injection here and here, and then in addition to the, and you can see what's happened in a few minutes, in addition to the dermal filler that she got, which raised up the corners of the mouth, now I'm going to take out the muscle action that pulls those corners down, and that treatment together will really be very effective for her. And because she's numb, and that's the great thing about doing these combination cases, she's numb here, because otherwise these can be fairly pinchy uh, to patients. But many times we do them without numbness there too. So I'm just going to start, not exactly in the corner, turn towards there a little bit there, Liz. We're going to start a quick little injection right there. And then another one here, just going to keep these symmetrical. And you can feel it right when you're in there. Turn towards me there just a little bit. And this muscle is right underneath the skin. You feel the texture of the muscle pretty easily. And then we're going to go here. It's usually four injections on the upper. And then it's going to be three injections on the lower. And on the lower, turn that way a little bit, we're going to go corner, corner, and then one smack in the middle here. So turn that way just a little bit. And all we're doing is giving her about one unit of Botox in each area there. and the rest is going to go right there. And that's it, that's gonna really help those lip lines all the way across. The other way to treat lip lines is also with some dermal fillers, but what you'd have to do is go through all of these lines and sometimes that just puffs out the lips way too much for them. And there are some other materials that you could use, but this is, gives you a much more natural approach there. So those are for the little lip lines around there. Now let's treat the depressor anguli oris and these are just simple, quick injections. And we're just going to go again from the corner of the mouth 
and just go down, straight down here. This is where it really fans out. So it's hard to miss down here. So you've got a lot of areas where you've got a, a lot of opportunity of where you can get it. If I try to isolate it right around the lip, it's really hard. It really, really is hard um, to try to catch it right up in there. Turn that way for me just a little bit, Liz. So we're going to give her just about two units right down there. And Liz has been a marvelous patient. She is good enough. And we're going to give her another two units right down there. So she's had a lot of treatment with Botox and dermal fillers, but you've seen a nice case all the way around of some comprehensive treatment. Again, you know, she's had some great dentistry done, and then you build everything around it. Now Liz will have a great looking smile, and she does not look anywhere near 62 years old. So you did great. Um, how about if Dr. Grever, you want to tell her a little bit of what to expect afterwards, and let's talk about post-op um, and what she should be doing and not doing. Liz can expect um, a minor amount of swelling over the next day or so. The lips are typically going to look a little bigger than they will ultimately at a week or two. So we're going to tell Liz to just take it easy over the next couple of days. No real um, intense exercise, exposure to extremes of cold or heat, and to really just not manipulate the area. Just tell patients, leave it alone. I mean, that's really the biggest thing. And, you know, as a joke, although it is somewhat serious, no kissing for the next few hours, okay? I mean, because sometimes they're so excited with your treatment, they just want to get up and hug you. Not kiss you, but hug you. Uh, but no kissing for the next few hours. You don't want to put any big uh, pressure on those lips especially because you could actually move some of these things around. Two weeks from now, evaluate them, and then we go ahead and do an enhancement procedure if the patient needs it at all with some smaller syringes of Juvederm and a little bit of Botox, and then you can really fine-tune what you need. But, you know, with this, we don't expect Liz has had it before, and she'll look great in a couple of weeks. So what you've seen in this program is really how the medical and dental come together for the overall aesthetic look of a patient and total facial aesthetics. Physicians should work closely in conjunction with dentists and vice versa to really get uh, an overall effect for the patient that addresses more than just a single uh, element of their aesthetic needs. What you've seen in this program too are the minimally invasive ways that dentists can integrate soft tissue aesthetics to go along with their dental aesthetics. And this is really essential. Dentistry as a whole is going to minimally invasive ways to treat teeth. But now, when you have this confluence of soft tissue aesthetics with the hard tissue aesthetics, I hope what you've seen here is that this is dentistry. Botox and dermal filler therapy, the way that we've been describing it in the oral and maxillofacial areas, certainly is dentistry. And opens up a whole new arena for dental practices, but certainly gives patients all kinds of alternatives now to crown lengthening procedures, more aggressive procedures. And it's up to you to, if you want to go ahead aggressive or non-aggressive, minimally invasive or more invasive. All those are appropriate approaches. But now we've got a lot of options open for our patients because we know that not all patients are going to go for the aggressive procedures. And there's no reason that every dental practice should not be getting into Botox and dermal fillers. There's no question it fits in perfectly with the dental practice as it has in mind now for the last few years. Um, it just fits right in. We give injections in these areas anyway. We know the muscles of mastication and muscles of facial expression. There's lots of therapeutic and cosmetic uses for Botox and dermal fillers. And thanks for being a part of this program. We hope with proper training, and it's so essential to get proper training in these procedures, that you'll jump into this whole arena and add it to your dental practice. You can contact the American Academy of Facial Aesthetics at 800-952-0521. Please visit www.facialaesthetics.org where you can find information on live patient hands-on Botox and dermal filler training for all healthcare professionals, given all across North America and other training DVDs on total facial aesthetics.